Okay. So it's uh, three minutes uh, past the three. I think uh, we, we can start. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Luisa Pagano, and I'm uh, the PC Secretariat Coordinator. I'm very happy to uh, welcome you all uh, to this uh, webinar on uh, emotional support and pancreatic cancer. Um, thank you for accepting uh, our invitations to our uh, speakers and panelists. Um, we go straight away to the um, presentations of, um, of the program. Uh, maybe before this, uh, just for you to know that we uh, will record the, um, uh, the webinar and we will use also the uh, intelligence, um, the artificial intelligence companion to uh, transcript uh, the, the webinar. So before uh, um, going into the content of, uh, uh, of the webinar, I would like to uh, give a, a very quick overview on, on the program of today. Um, this uh, uh, webinar is um, uh, co-organized in cooperation with uh, a European Pancreatic uh, Club and Gabriele Capurso is uh, the uh, general secretary will welcome us uh, to this, uh, this webinar. Then uh, we will have a keynote speech from uh, uh, Lucia Travado from Champalimo Foundation, and she will uh, introduce us to the importance of emotional support uh, for pancreatic cancer patients. And then uh, we will have uh, um, a, a panel discussions with uh, different uh, panelists, uh, uh, tackling the, um, the impact of emotional support on pancreatic cancer qualities uh, of life. Um, if we have time, we will have then a questions and answers uh, uh, sessions. And uh, we will conclude uh, with the presentations of uh, the project, uh, our the PC project, Emotional Support uh, and Pancreatic Cancer by Christiana van der Hoeven and uh, Alfredo Carrato, our chair, will uh, make the final uh, remark um, and conclu conclude the, the webinar. Um, so I, I would like then now to um, introduce uh, uh, Gabriele Capurso, uh, the Secretary General of um, uh, EPC. Uh, so if the next slide uh, can come, yes. So um, Gabriele Capurso is a professor of uh, gastroenterology at San Raffaele University Hospital in Milan, in Italy. And his areas of expertise include pancreatic cancer, chronic pancreatitis, hereditary pancre pancreatic conditions, and uh, cystic pancre pancreatic lesions. His role as a general secretary of the European Pancreatic Club has further solidified his leadership in the field, uh, where he has focused on driving international collaboration, supporting younger researchers, and organizing scientific events that bridge the gap between basic science and clinical practice. Thank you, Gabriele, for being with us. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Risa, and uh, above all, thanks to, to PC, to Alfredo, Nurian, and, and all the uh, sorry PCE team, because this is really an important topic for the webinar. It's something we, we don't probably talk enough about, and uh, so for me, it's a pleasure and an honor, of course, as General Secretary of European Pancreatic Club, but more simply as a doctor taking care daily of patients with pancreatic cancer, as a researcher conducting research on pancreatic cancer. By the way, also as a son of a pancreatic cancer survivor, my father to, 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 to introduce the, this afternoon webinar. And uh, I don't need to tell you uh, the, the immense toll that patients who receive the diagnosis of pancreatic cancer, let's say pay in terms of physical uh, stress and, and the consequences of treatment and of symptoms, but the psychological burden is not less, it's equal, probably is more. And just imagine any of you being told that you have diagnosis like that and that 
anything will happen in Italy. It could be fear, anxiety, depression, and shall I tell my friends and family, yes, no, what, what should I do? What should I expect for the future? So total uncertainty uh, about the future. And, and this is why uh, about half of these patients uh, will develop clinically relevant psychological problems that need treatment. And this is why we should include this in the multidisciplinary team and multidisciplinary care of, of, of these patients. So uh, I don't have much more to tell you. I'm really interested at listening to, to the whole webinar today. And I think we don't have to forget all the stakeholders. We as clinicians, scientific societies, patients association, politicians, uh, and you know, policymakers generally speaking that we need to, to do more for these patients. And this is one of the areas where we probably do less, honestly. So I'm just very happy to, to open the webinar and uh, I'm sure it's going to be great and uh, I will listen carefully. So thanks once again and uh, uh, every great meeting also from, uh, from uh, EPC. We're all very happy to support this, uh, this uh, webinar. Thank you, Gabriele, for introducing uh, uh, and opening the topic at, and the, the webinar and introducing uh, the relevant uh, topic of, of our sessions. And that's why I go straight uh, to the introducing Lucia Travado. Uh, she's our keynote uh, speaker today. And uh, Lucia is um, a clinical health psychologist specialized in psycho-oncology. Uh, with a clinical hospital career uh, of more than uh, 35 years. Uh, currently uh, is a senior clinician and a researcher on psycho-oncology at the Champalimau Foundation in Portugal. She, she teaches communication skills and psychological oncology for organizations such as uh, ESO and ESMO and at university level. Uh, she participated in many European Cancer Policy Initiatives since 2006, uh, she collaborates with the Portuguese and Slovenian's EU presidency um, and uh, um, to, in order to, to place cancer as a priority on the European health agenda, uh, including psychological care in the treatment of cancer patients and survivors. Uh, she is the president emeritus uh, of the International Psycho-Oncology Society uh, advisory board member of the European School of Oncology and founder and former president of the Viva Mujer Viva Association. In 2022, uh, she received the, the Jimmy Holland Memorial Award, a very prestigious international award in psycho-oncology. Thank you, Lucia, for being with us today, and uh, we are uh, ready to listen to your uh, keynote speech. Uh, thank you, Louisa. It is my big pleasure to be here with you. I'm sorry for the long uh, introduction. It was very nice, but a little bit long. Uh, I'm, I'm um, happy to be here talking about this very dear area of my working days, every days with cancer patients, and to talk about their suffering uh, from a disease, in this case, pancreatic cancer, which is still in this time very dreadful and very disturbing for our patients. So I'm going and thank you, Gabriele, for making the point of uh, a son of someone who has endured cancer because families also are uh, part of this uh, nucleus of, uh, of issues, psychological and emotional issues. I will be trying to um, share my screen. Hopefully this works. Give me a little bit of a, let's see if it works. Is it working or not? Are you seeing this? Almost there, Lucia. We still have the, what, the black uh, screen. Now it works. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So it is, uh, I congratulate and greet the Pancreatic Cancer Europe to have a addressed this issue, which is always a little bit on the silence and uh, mode and neglected uh, because patients 
usually have more difficulty in disclosing that they are suffering. Um, they feel somehow it's not the, the, the purpose to, to disclose that. And most of the time, healthcare professionals also do not ask these questions. So let's see how can we improve our care to patients. First, it is very important to know that although the dis disease is very problematic, and in this case, it brings a scenario of a uh, dreadful scenario, um, mostly the patient um, emotional reaction reacts to the uh, this uh, the way they perceive uh, their disease as well as their resources. But because hands, cancer has a very bad reputation, the emotion uh, that it uh, arises from the patient brings uh, them all the past experiences uh, related to cancer and what they have heard in the media about it. So um, we need to perceive that all of a sudden with the diagnosis, this also uh, opens up their demons boxes, uh, their Pandora box about all the things that they have feared or have heard about what is cancer. Also, uh, cancer impacts on a multi-dimensional level. It's not the only the physical level by the pains and the fatigue that the cancer and the treatment brings uh, to the patient along with the, the, the treatment in the dysfunctionalities and the impacts on sexual life. But also they are being um, filled with emotions that in many cases they have not felt before. Very strong emotions of sadness, of despair, worries, loss of uh, autonomy and control. Things that they are not usually um, uh, related with or have experience with. Because this is a very frightening situation. They don't know anything about uh, cancer usually, and what they know is not helpful. And so it disrupts their life. Also, their roles, family and social interpersonal roles, it puts pressure on uh, financial strains. And also, probably it's the first time that they realize uh, their mortality and uh, have to confront with uh, issues of what's going to happen. And also, they have to deal with um, uh, uh, strangers, which is us, healthcare professionals, which they have to uh, build trust, and we have to be part of uh, the solution. We have to facilitate this pro uh, this um, relationship by using um, communicate good communication skills to help facilitate this coping process of understanding a disease that they don't know about, understanding what are my hopes, what are my, the solutions, uh, what can I hope for, uh, how can I, um, uh, how can, what is my role, how can I support and help all the process. So it is very much up to us, the healthcare professionals, to guide the patient into the right direction to keep them hopeful and engaged into treatment. And for that, we have to have uh, a lot of empathy, respect, listening, uh, and um, trying to understand wh who is the person in front of us? What do they want? What is their concerns? What do they expect? What are their aims? Um, because this is uh, brings an array of demons, as I call them, fears and um, alterations in patients' lives, um, they suffer emotionally. And this has been described as distress to destigmatize it from the psychopathological nomenclature because they are not, they don't have um, an acute, uh, they don't have a psychopathological problem. They have just an emotional reaction um, related to the cancer diagnosis and to the cri this crisis of having to endure all of these changes and not knowing, in many cases, what to expect. 
And so while these some patients deal well um, or less badly with the situation and they adjust, others uh, will not adjust so well and will tend to develop um, situations of anxiety and depression, which will impair all the process of treatment and, uh, and um, ultimately clinical outcomes. Uh, pancreatic cancer has prevalence of around 37% of patients that have this severe type of stress that requires emotional uh, specialized support from uh, uh, psychologists specialized in psycho-oncology. And uh, we know that pancreatic cancer has a high mortality, poor prognosis, and uh, while there has been some progress, the five-year and 10-year survival rates are still low, and there is a, a high burden of cancer-related symptoms, pain and digestive problems, and also emotional ones, and depression, anxiety, that interfere with sleep. There is excessive worry and ruminative thoughts, difficult concentrating, and sometimes maladaptive behaviors, such as increased use of alcohol and other drugs, social withdrawal and somatic complaints. Depression and anxiety affect the quality of life, the motivation to engage in treatment, cancer uh, clinical outcomes, and even become a major cause of death because patients are more prone uh, to suicidal ideation, which we, we have to capture. Also, uh, this depression, this emotional disturbance not only affects the patient, but also the family. And the, the, the studies show that indeed pancreatic cancer is one of the highest with uh, emotional um, alterations, uh, either depression, anxiety, or mixed anxiety and depression. Uh, the problem is, besides in impairing quality of life, is that if we don't attend, if we don't address this um, depression, it impairs clinical outcomes, as I was mentioned, not only by impairing quality of life, but it reduces compliance with treatment, less efficacy of chemotherapy, um, the patient becomes more psychosomatic, so shorter survival expectancy, longer hospital stays, increased cost, burden for the family, and as I mentioned, higher risk of suicide. Studies have shown with other populations that if we react like this with um, a maladjustive coping attitude like these patients, uh, breast cancer patients with a helplessness, hopelessness attitude, uh, 10 years uh, of studying uh, follow-up shows that they survive less than patients who have reacted uh, more adjustedly. And this goes on for other cancers, and that we have verified that depression, for instance, is a predictor of mortality among cancer patients after stem cell transplantation, as you can see here in this uh, graph. So he, we have a lot of uh, uh, nowadays uh, scientific studies which show this relationship of, the pre of depression with the poor clinical outcomes, which brings the notion that psychosocial care is important in the treatment of, of patients. It's not a luxury, but indeed an essential requirement for the treatment of cancer patients. In this study with many patients, almost 24,000, they found out that uh, almost 8% of patients had the diagnosis of depression. A diagnosis of depression is already the extreme of the distress. Uh, you've seen that 37% of patients have severe depress, uh, severe distress, which 8% can be severe depression, okay? And this depression is linked uh, in local regional disease with 37% uh, lower odds of undergoing surgical resection, and the depression was associated with a lower uh, two-year survival and for patients who underwent surgical resection, depression was a significant predictor of survival. Of um, uh, And um, 
um, patients with distant disease, sorry, these are the grafts, did also had lower odds of receiving chemotherapy. So we see that depression really impairs uh, the possibilities of patients have better outcomes. So the recommendation is that we should recognize this emotional uh, suffering in patients and improve uh, the treatment so that they have access to uh, better clinical outcomes. These are the curves of what I've just shown you in survival of two uh, years of pancreatic cancer patients and the ones who have depression always have uh, worse results. So uh, there are some theories and explanations about why does this happen. And most of the studies have shown on biobehavioral studies linked with the negative emotions that there are inflammatory processes, biochemical, immunology, and hormonal processes that can explain why they have uh, poor outcomes. But they also have poor outcomes because they don't understand in many cases, what's going on, the catastrophize the, 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 the situation, and they don't see a light at the end of the tunnel, um, and they don't um, enjoy the journey of their own life uh, and their quality of life that they can have. The good news is that we have uh, interventions at the psycho-oncological level have, has, have proven its efficacy and efficiency in reducing anxiety. I bring here this uh, table showing different um, interventions which have been proven level one and two evidence for reducing anxiety. It is, and the same for depression. So we have various uh, uh, tools that uh, do improve um, and reduce this distress, allowing patients a better uh, opportunity for survival, like this uh, randomized controlled trial of cognitive behavioral stress management for breast cancer patients, with um, uh, show that patients who have undergone intervention for reducing their emotional distress have better uh, survival um, outcomes than the ones that did not. Other uh, Techniques used also to uh, that show uh, a large to moderate effect on the mental health of breast cancer patients. And I would like to end up my introduction by um, addressing this European Cancer Organization essential requirements for quality cancer care for pancreatic cancer patients, which already recognizes uh, that while there is the core multidisciplinary treatment team to treat the disease, there is the extension, the importance of the extended multidisciplinary team uh, to support all that is going on at the personal level. And psycho-oncologists should be part of the, the treatment uh, multidisciplinary team. And that this care should be provided, that's what the recommendations state, must be provided at all stages of the disease and its treatment. Um, for family, patients and families, and be present to ensure comprehensive cancer care. The distress thermometer, which is a tool similar to the pain uh, thermometer to assess distress in patients, which can give us an idea of the level of suffering most likely, or most in parallel, like the pain assessment to give us an idea of how severe is this distress for the patient so that we can make a referral for specialized psychosocial care for the patients who need it. Um, and that uh, psychosocial interventions uh, do follow clinical practice guidelines. So to close, I would like to give you here um, a phrase from my good friend who is director of the psycho-oncology department at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, that he says, when you have pancreatic cancer, convening a support team to address all of your needs is the key first step to success. Unfortunately, it's not uncommon for patients and caregivers to focus their efforts on the physical cancer at the expense of addressing the whole person. But bolstering patients' mental health is just as critical. As we have seen, it helps to optimize clinical outcomes, including 
survival and of course quality of life. So I would end by saying no one with cancer should be left alone with their demons, their fears, their uncertainties. They should be helped to have tools to address this um, common enemy, uh, their own uh, exaggerated fears and to help them to live their own life as best as possible. Although we know the journey has many challenges, but nevertheless, uh, if we have a good support system, the patient is more likely to still enjoy uh, his life, even if it's still enduring treatment in many cases. So I thank you. I have the fortunate to be working at the Champalimau uh, Foundation, which has recently um, uh, opened up a bo the Botton Champalimau Pancreatic Cancer Center, which is this one here, linked with the uh, 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 initial foundation, which we address all, all the types of cancer, adult cancers. But this is a whole building only dedicating to this area of pancreatic cancer because it has been one uh, in the last uh, decades that have not seen much progress in terms of survival. And so we want also to be part of the international community that supports patients and finds solutions to improve their outcomes. So thank you very much for having me and for addressing this issue. And hopefully that will help uh, all the hospitals and countries to place more attention in the ca pancreatic cancer patients' needs while uh, in treatment and afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Lucia. Thank you very much for introducing us to these very, very important uh, issues and also showing the scientific uh, evidences of the importance of uh, um, uh, psychological support and emotional support uh, uh, during uh, the whole phases of uh, uh, the pancreatic cancer journey. And um, it was uh, also very interesting for me to see the recommendations that uh, you showed us. Uh, we share uh, very much with you uh, the, the feeling that we need to work more uh, and uh, to, to be united also in these uh, battles to, uh, to, uh, to see some improvements in, uh, in all hospitals regarding uh, psychological support. And uh, the panel discussions uh, that we uh, propose you now um, sees uh, uh, the um, uh, experts in the field, uh, practitioners, uh, uh, patients, uh, um, professionals, uh, um, dealing with uh, um, emotional uh, support in pancreatic cancer. And uh, uh, we invited the panelists uh, um, so that they can share their experience according to uh, their expertise. So that's why we invited uh, Talia Golan. Uh, she's a, 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 an oncologist uh, and a researcher uh, from uh, the Sheba Medical. Uh, oh, sorry, no, can you go back? I wanted just uh, to highlight uh, the, the topics uh, that we wanted to, to share in uh, the panel discussions. Uh, then we invited uh, Helena Olgren. Um, she is an oncology nurse, and uh, uh, she will uh, give her input uh, uh, on the importance of uh, support uh, uh, during the treatment. Then we have Andro Lauro, a psychologist, uh, tackling the, the, the issues on the uh, support for uh, caregivers. Then we have uh, uh, Nicola Murphy from uh, Pancreatic Cancer UK. Uh, she gives uh, her uh, input uh, and share experiences on uh, support, emotional support uh, to the end of life. And then we have uh, a very uh, concrete uh, uh, experience from uh, um, a patient, former patient uh, survivor, Anders Boving from uh, uh, Palema Association in Sweden. So thank you to the panelists for being with us today. So I, I introduce uh, uh, briefly Talia Golan from uh, the Sheba Medical Center uh, in Israel. Uh, Talia, can, can you move? Okay. 
Talia, uh, she's a clinician and scientist and the medical director uh, of the phase one unit and the pancreatic cancer center at the Sheba Medical Center in Israel. Her clinical and research expertise focus uh, on the understanding and treatment of hereditary pancreatic cancers and patients. She is a co-global uh, principal in investigator of uh, the first uh, biomarker the selected phase three clinical trial in uh, uh, pancreatic cancer, the POLO study. Her research focuses on improving the standard of care options for pancreatic cancer patients by both funding targeted treatments tailored for each patient based on his own genetic background and developing a state of the art early detection methodology. So thank you, um, Talia, for um, uh, being with us. Uh, the first question to you is, uh, um, in uh, your opinion, uh, what can healthcare providers uh, uh, do better uh, to um, uh, uh, emotionally support the patients at the moment of uh, diagnosis, uh, considering the shock and fear that often accompanies such uh, news? Um, so I'm talking. Uh, um, I'm talking in part as my role as a physician. I see probably between thirty to sixty pancreatic cancer patients a week, um, and some weeks we see out of them about four to eight new patients. Um, I've been doing. I've been doing pri primary pancreatic cancer for probably more than fifteen years now. Um, I also um, I've also discussed a little bit um, this with my nurse practitioner so that there's a little bit of a more um, uh, expansive uh, thought process in how I answer this question. Um, I think that the, for me, what is most um, prominent when I meet my patients is the um, I would say the fear. That um, that accompanies our, in, our our dialogue and our interaction, and this fear is may can make it hard to um, communicate with our patients for them to understand what I'm saying for them to comprehend. They listen, but it's very hard for them to comprehend because they're in such a state of fear. So it's fear, shock, um, denial. Not not so much anger or anything like that. It's just more like the, the probably like I, I would say out of all the um emotional um the emotional feelings that that are transferred to me, I would say that fear is the most dominant um at the, at the initial diagnosis. And even people with very strong support systems, like very strong families or um, friends, or even people that have a lot of coping tools that have gone through a lot in life, even in those patients, this is very evident. And this really impacts the ability for them to interact in our first meetings. So um, two things that I've thought about, and I, I think that um, intuitively, intuitively, I've just done it through my practice over the years, is um, to remember it for me in my mind, and I also reflect this to the patient, that we don't have to discuss everything in our first meeting. Not everything has to be discussed. So that's one thing that I have to also remember because sometimes, you know, we, we're so used to doing our work because we just continue speaking. We don't reflect on what we're saying. So that's the one thing. And the second thing, if my patients ask me very difficult questions, sometimes I can say to them, as well that this is the first meeting we don't have to ask and answer every question and we can maybe go back to that question at a later date when we have more information about the biology of their tumor so it's not that i'm um, not listening to them or not answering them the question but not every question that asks is that is asked once an answer so like those are two things that i try to remember um when i first meet my patients i think really like dividing um, and dividing all the difficult information that we have, I think that's a big thing. So I don't want to carry on too long for this question. And yes. I hope yes, that's so thank helpful. You. Yes, yeah, so thank you also for sharing uh, your uh, uh, 
experience and best practices in uh, approaching uh, patients. Then from a global uh, point of view, what do you think uh, uh, healthcare systems can better, uh, how can better facilitate access to the relevant resources uh, for emotional support? Um, so I, I really, I think that because pancreatic cancer is such an emotionally exhausting um, diagnosis for the patients, the family, and also for the, the staff that are treating, I think that we have to take into consideration this cannot be a one-man team. It can't be um, one physician. Um, I think this is from, I think all most cancers, but I think particularly for pancreatic cancer, it's very evident that you need a, a nurse practitioner that's, that has expertise in pancreatic cancer and the special needs of our patients uh, or social workers, psychiatrists, psychologists, um, ex this is a case managers. So I think it's not so important how we call the people in the staff. I think it's just really important to acknowledge this cannot be a one man show. Personally, mm -hmm. I did it a lot by myself for many years. And when I think back, those were very traumatic years for me personally, when I think back about it, but I think also that I could never give my patients the kind of care that they're getting now that we are a much more extensive team. We have a case manager that's only for pancreatic cancer patients. We have a nurse practitioner that is only for pancreatic cancer. And then we have psychologists and social workers that do all the cancers. And I think that for me, that is a key element. And I think that all of us have to try and approach this particularly challenging d disease with this multidisciplinary team approach. And that will also facilitate to divide giving the, the, the information in a, in a staggered way and not all in once by one person from one angle. So like, obviously, if you think about it, and this will be my last sentence, that as a physician, I have very particular things in my mind that I want to discuss with the patient, but a nurse practitioner has other things. And that is really valuable for the patient because of this fear that really predominantly um, will guide the effect of our first uh, our first few visits very dominantly. Yes, thank you, thank you, Talia. Uh, indeed, uh, was very interesting to 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 listen to your expertise and to the suggestions uh, uh, that you gave to us. Uh, now we we come to uh, um, another practitioner, um, um, Helena Ulgren. Uh, Talia was introducing the importance of uh, oncological, uh, oncology nurse. And uh, uh, here we have uh, Helena uh, is a passionate cancer nurse uh, that has worked in cancer care, mainly in the oncology department, in patient wards, uh, outpatient clinic, uh, and now in the emergency department for cancer uh, patients. She is uh, specialized in oncology as well as uh, palliative care and also has a PhD. In her daily job, she is uh, responsible for palliative care in cancer teams at the Karolinska Comprehensive Cancer Center in Sweden and involved in clinical research within uh, this field. She has been engaged in uh, European Oncology Nursing Society for several years and she is currently its uh, president-elect. Uh, Thank you, Helena, for being uh, with us uh, today. So the, the first uh, questions to you is uh, um, being aware of the different emotions uh, that patients experience uh, during uh, treatments. Uh, what type uh, of emotional support do you consider uh, more helpful uh, um, in this uh, specific phase uh, of the cancer journey? Uh, I think for me, uh, I, I've been working with pancreatic cancers, you know, on and off for many years. Now I work with hey, many. Uh, Helena, I think your camera is off or at least I don't see you. No, it's on. No, it's on. Okay, then probably yes, it's my computer. It's on. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Um, anyway, I've been working with, uh, you know, pancreatic cancer on and off for many years in different, you know, from the different perspectives. But if I'm thinking about uh, my job as a nurse during treatment, one of the things that is sort of very much uh, specific for this group is that, for example, many of them have 
become very sick without having so much symptoms, like it's been a silent, you know, disease until they come to us, they're quite sick already. Of course, not everyone, but many of our patients. And uh, like you have all the others of you have spoke ab about the cho shock and everything, but also that time is an essence. So I'm thinking as a nurse, you need to really guide and coordinate, but also uh, specific for this group, I think it's that uh, you need to kind of offer support early because many of my patients coming in with the pancreatic cancer diagnosis, they have had, like I said, symptoms, but quite diffuse for a long time. And also many of them, them have a lot of symptoms when we start treatment and they get more symptoms during the treatment. And it's very hard for the patients to know, is this my disease? Is this the treatment? And I feel that to have a kind of a, a relationship between the nurse and the patient is so important because you, you have to build a trusting relationship in a way, because also I note this, for example, patient coming into the emergency department where I work during treatment, they have been so sick from the treatment, but if they don't have someone they really dare to talk about everything with, it might not come forward because also all the patients I have, they're so keen not to be too sick to get the treatment. So it's a specific situation, I think, for this group because uh, we don't have a huge amount of treatments to offer, even though things are progressing. So I think it's a sensitive and vulnerable situation, even under treatment. But on the other hand, during treatment, you have something to do. You have like a work that you go to, you go to your treatments, you're kind of having hope for this to help. But I think as a nurse, we need to prepare the patients for also, you know, what happens next. And that is something I, I, I a little bit struggle with uh, because we kind of, we focus a lot on the treatment and then suddenly when you can't take the treatment anymore, time is short. So this is something I, I really think is important to think about. And I really agree with the previous speaker on have being a team. Um, I also think that, you know, we have to, uh, involve the patients maybe more and ask what matters to you and you know discuss the goal of the treatment is even more important yeah. for this group of patients not only to prolong life or decrease symptoms we have to take in the patient and ask what they want and what is important so a teamwork is also crucial of course but for me as a nurse I do feel that the uh, these this group of patient is um crucial to have a good continuity of staff they should know us and also a lot of time you know i really think so yeah. even though we don't have that that's important uh you cannot just build a new relationship with new people all the time and usually the nurse is the sort of key here i think yeah yes yeah, so thank you for sharing your experience and um, uh, what uh, what do you think that the healthcare system can uh, uh, how can better facilitate access to the relevant resources for emotional support? I think how in can terms, be... yeah, I mean in in terms of emotional support, uh, I think we need to be able to um, you know uh, be very very easy to refer. If I have some patient that I feel she needs more than I can provide then we need to have clear pathways to refer someone to maybe a counselor, or if you have a family that is suffering, you should have access to this. So the, the healthcare system needs to have a holistic, you know, um, approach. And uh, we we should collaborate more, I think, with, with, with palliative care teams early, because even if the patient is not in a palliative late stage, they can have a lot of benefits from early supportive care and symptom management. So I would wish mm -hmm. the healthcare system to be more um, coordinated and integrated in terms of the acute care and the palliative care. And I think this is particularly important for this group from my perspective. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much, uh, Helena, for sharing uh, your uh, experience and uh, best practices. Um, we move now to uh, another important topic, so the support to caregivers. We have heard how important it is that caregivers in terms of family are also uh, well supported. And here uh, 
I am pleased to introduce to you Andre Louro. He is a clinical and health psychologist, a member of the Portuguese Psychological Association. He holds the European Certificate in Psychology and a PhD in Health and Sport Psychology from the Autonomous University of Barcelona in Spain. He is a member of the American Psychological Association, assistant professor at the Piaget Institute in Portugal, member at the Piaget Research Center for Ecological Human Development, and research collaborator uh, at the Psychology Research Center uh, at the University of Minho in Portugal. He's a psychologist in two cancer patients associations, Europa Colon Portugal and uh, Mama Help. So, uh, Andre, thank you for uh, being with us uh, today, this afternoon. Um, so then according to your uh, experience and to your expertise, uh, how can caregivers be encouraged to prioritize uh, their own uh, emotional health while providing care and what specific resources could you recommend? Okay, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I'd like to, to, to thank you for the invitation and to talk about my practice, about this kind of subject. Um, I'm working with Europa Con in Portugal. It's a Portuguese association that we help uh, caregivers and the patients with the disease, a digestive disease. And we have nowadays, we have a support line for uh, caregivers. So I'm going to talk about my experience and I will give some tips that uh, now normally we work with this kind of uh, patients and with these uh, caregivers. So first of all, um, normally the caregivers, uh, they have own emotional health uh, and it's important to provide the care is critical critical to preventing burnout and and burn, and ensuring they can continue to provide the best care as possible. So the caregivers often become so focused on the needs of the person and they are caring for that they neglect uh, their own well-being. So I'm going to give some tips, uh, some strategies to help caregivers to prioritize their emotional health. So one of first is normalize self-care as a necessity. So okay. the caregivers need to understand that prioritizing their own emotional health isn't selfish, but essential. A caregiver who normally neglects their uh, well-being is more prone to stress, burnout, physical illness, which ultimately affects their ability to provide quality care and, uh, and uh, encourage caregivers to recognize and name, for example, their emotions. It's important that, uh, first of all, they have to recognize their emotions and uh, their thinkings. So emotions like guilt, frustration, sadness are common, but a knowledge of these feelings is a first step toward managing that effectively. The second a uh, tip and a strategy that normally we work is promote healthy boundaries. Encourage caregivers to set boundaries and not take on too much. So it, it is okay to ask for help and recognize their own limits. So the caregivers need to learn how to communicate their needs and limitations effectively to the both the person they are caring and their support of network too. Third, encourage self-compassion. Caregivers can be overwhelming and caregivers may feel like they are not doing enough. Encourage them to be kind to themselves and the knowledge that they are doing the best they can is crucial. Teach caregivers to practice self-compassion by be mindful of their needs and forgiving themselves when they fall short. For the set strategy, provide education and research on caregiver health. Caregivers need 
to know how they are not they are not alone and that their their emotional health is just as, as important as physical care they provide. So provide resorts of self-care strategies, warning sites of burnout and coping mechanisms can be a preventive measure. Another thing that is important is encourage regular breaks. So encourage a, a, a caregivers to take a small breaks through the day. For example, five minutes to meditate, stretch, or take a small walk can help manage stress levels and prevent burnout. Six, another thing that is important is a, a foster a healthy work-like balance. Normal caregivers should be encouraged to maintain hobbies or activities that bring them joy and relaxation relationship uh, it's for example it's important to read gardening or painting having time for personal fulfillment is the key to the emotional health for example caregivers can be overwhelmed by the immediate demands of caregiver but helping them set realistic, realistic expectations for the future is good. For example, uh, long-term care planning is a, a good way to uh, alleviate the stress. Another thing that normally we uh, can do is, is teach a stress manage management techniques. For example, deep breathing, uh, guided meditation, um, mindfulness can reduce stress, increase emotional resilience and stay grounded. So encourage a regular physical activity or even something as simple stretching or walking, as I told, can have a huge impact on mental well-being. Another thing that is important to is create a support system. Caregivers often benefit from connecting with others who understand their unique challenge. So support groups can provide emotional relief and a sense of community. So encourage caregivers to seek counseling or therapy can help them cope with stress, grief, and burnout. So here are some of several strategies that to help caregivers prioritize their emotional health. Yeah, thank you uh, very much for um, uh, for sharing with us these uh, uh, these tools and uh, these uh, strategies that uh, uh, can support uh, uh, the well-being of the carers. And um, in your in your opinion, what else uh, we could uh, um, uh, suggest uh, uh, caregivers to to do? Uh, or which tools or which other uh, um, uh, activities can be uh, suggested to uh, to face the emotional burden during uh, the care of uh, uh, their beloved? Um, for to help mitigate this kind of uh, mitigate the emotional challenge that the caregivers normally have, uh, we can have a. Uh, uh, some practical support strategies. So uh, you can implement to offer both immediate relief or a long-term emotional resilience. So one of the first that is very important is education training about their loved one's condition. So provide a caregiver with education about their loved one's condition as well as caregiving skills, for example, managing the medical needs, navigating the healthcare system can reduce stress and increase confidence. Uh, so feeling more equipped to handle caregiving challenges can alleviate anxiety and sense of helplessness. So knowledge is empowering and can help caregivers anticipate needs and reduce stress. So many for example, uh, nowadays, like uh, many uh, healthcare systems from the Portuguese and uh, uh, a lot of associations, we have sometimes we have uh, workshops, uh, free caregiver workshops, that's or webinars like we have this one, 
to 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 give some uh, strategies that will help uh, the patients to manage the care and the understanding the medical equipment. Another thing that is important too is uh, the time management and the task delegation. So caregivers often feel overwhelmed by the sheer number of tasks that they must manage. So help them create a realistic schedules and delegate tasks where possible can alleviate some of that pressure. So time management stretches allow caregivers to organize, organize their day, prioritize tasks, and allocate specific times for self-care. So help caregivers develop a daily schedule, or for example, it's important to do uh, some task list. So, and uh, it's important to give a, a, a caregivers to delegate responsibilities when possible, such as asking a family members for help with a specific tax or seeking out, for example, in a non-medical system or some neighbors, for example, and uh, uh, is a good way to, um, to manage the, the, the time. Another thing that is important is physical and emotional health support. Normally, the caregivers often, often neglect their own physical and emotional needs. So is it important to have a regular self-care activities, for example, physically and uh, emotional healthy? Um, so the regular self-care is, is important, as I told, uh, reducing stress, improving emotional resilience, maintain overall health. And for example, it's not about grand gestures, but uh, like to make some small uh, habits, sustainable habits. So mm -hmm. one thing that is important is uh, you, they can make encourage carers to set aside time for self-care, care, uh, even just a few minutes each day. Simple practice, practice like stretching, deep breathing, listening to music, that is very important too. Is uh, We have a, 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 significant, a significant impact. Uh, provide the fitness programs. Sometimes we have online, for example. Um, so this also includes a regular check-ins with healthcare providers to address any caregiver special health concerns. Another thing is a social support. So uh, mm -hmm. it's important the family, the friends, the community, uh, the network that they can uh, have to make them feel less alone and more capable of manage their responsibilities. So it's important to encourage family members or close friends to take uh, turns helping with caregiver tasks and simple offering emotional support. Um, another thing that is important, that is very important, encourage express writing is a good way to uh, express and to write uh, their emotions. And uh, it, this is important because it's, it can reduce stress, make sense of their experience, experience. And they can express if writing can serve as emotion outlet, allowing caregivers to, to write the frustrations, fears, and worries. Uh, it's, like a, it's, it's like a sense of catharsis. Uh, mm -hmm. Another thing that is important too is the technology tools. Uh, nowadays, we have a lot of technology. So we have, for example, they can use uh, like medication reminders. Uh, we have a, a lot of apps, applications, uh, and these tools can provide uh, convenience and, and a peace of mind. Um, as I told, uh, it's important and uh, caregiver support groups too, because they can mm -hmm. talk about uh, their experience. For example, Facebook, sometimes they have a, a, a lot of groups and they can contact which uh, and, uh, can, can give a, a, to join a local or line support groups and they can uh, talk with them. So, and they can interact, share advice or provide a mutual support. Another thing that is important too, is very important is when financial stress is a sing significant, significant source of emotional strain for many caregivers. So connecting caregivers with resources for a financial, financial assistance uh, is very important too. So, uh, it's important to find a financial system uh, can reduce the stress of managing caregiving costs 
which can help caregivers feel more supported and less overwhelmed. For example, we have a family caregiver support problems, uh, for example. And uh, I, I'm, I'm already finished. So another thing that okay. we have here in, in Portugal, we have the respite care too. This provides a temporary relief for caregivers by allowing them to take a break from their caregiver duties. And the last one, if you need help, of course, you have to find the counseling and therapy uh, because uh, to manage the caregiving, such as grief, depression, and anxiety. So for, for to finish, by offering a combination of these strategies, caregivers can experience a better emotional well-being and they have a great sense of support, which in turn can uh, enhance their ability to provide mm -hmm. care. Yes, so thank you, Andre, for this uh, very detailed uh, list of uh, suggestions uh, for uh, caregivers. Uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, those uh, assisting uh, the webinar can uh, make use uh, of it. And uh, we are coming now to another uh, sensitive topic, uh, thanks to the participations of uh, Nicola Marti. She will uh, share with us uh, the experience of supporting uh, uh, families uh, and patients uh, towards the end of life. And uh, Nicola, she is uh, qualifying from, since she qualified from the university in Liverpool in 2006, uh, she started her career as a community nurse, going on to specialize in palliative care, both in the community and uh, in a hospice uh, setting. Uh, from there, she moved uh, into oncology in the Liverpool uh, Royal uh, Hospital, providing information, emotional support, uh, and practical advice uh, to individuals and their families affected by cancer uh, diagnosis. Uh, for the last six year, uh, years, uh, she has worked as a pancreatic cancer specialist nurse for uh, the charity Pancreatic Cancer UK, uh, working uh, on a support line for people affected by pancreatic cancer, including those uh, diagnosed and uh, loved ones. In March uh, 2024, uh, she became clinical lead for uh, the charity. Thank you, uh, Nichi, Nicola, for being with us. Um, so the first uh, questions to you is, uh, how um, can emotional support for patients and their families be enhanced in the end of life care settings, especially considering the complexity of grief and loss. Thanks, Louisa. Uh, well, I think Helena spoke about this earlier and I think this really is the key um, when we're thinking about that level of emotional support with this patient group. Very difficult, complex symptoms, both physically, emotionally and psychologically. Um, we know um, about the higher levels of depression compared to other cancers. So I think the key is about early intervention of good palliative care early on in someone's diagnosis, because we know as well, because of the complexities of this disease, that things happen very quickly. So time is not on our side to provide support um, to these patients. So if we are involved in those teams that provide good emotional support, like palliative care teams early on in that journey, um, it builds up trust with health professionals. You can develop those relationships early on. Um, there was a study done a few years ago that looked at late referral into palliative care teams and how having to transition to a whole new team of health professionals um, could cause distress because the trust isn't there. They don't know these new health professionals. So I think that is really uh, the most important point when we're looking at emotional support for end of life. Um, and also because it gives people who are diagnosed and their families the opportunity to be able to talk about what's important to them at that point in their life. What do they want? What do they need? Where do they want to be? Um, if we're not having those conversations earlier on, it can be quite difficult to have them at that point of end of life, because as I say, things can happen quite quickly. Um, so yeah, I think that is the, the biggest thing I would say to take away from that is that early intervention. As health professionals, we need 
be assessing the level of support that people need. So we know the whole range of emotions that um, has already been discussed, you know, the fear, the anxiety, the stress, the worry. We need to look at, we need to be able to distinguish which of those emotions need um, more of an intervention. So at what point do we involve psychological services? At what point do we need to look at um, medical treatments as well to support with someone's emotional and psychological needs? Um, in terms of end of life as well, and this comes back to when we were talking about advanced care planning and making sure that we understand what someone's needs are, we need to be looking at spiritual and holistic needs and um, have they been addressed have the the people that need to be involved and had those conversations had had the time to to do that has it been spoken about and something that we talk about a lot um with people that we speak to here on the support line at pancreatic cancer uk is about anticipatory grief so it's that emotion of how do you start to process what life is going to be like um after after death um so we talk about that a lot and i think that's something as health professionals we really need to be um aware of and be brave to have those conversations with people um i think sometimes as health professionals we shy away from having those conversations to try and protect people but actually it's really important that 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 space is given um to be able to talk openly um, I think someone touched on this earlier as well, but about providing that practical support um, and intervention for things that could be causing someone distress. So, for example, they might have concerns about finances and um, mm. financial planning. Has that been addressed? Have the right right people been involved to, to help to have those conversations? Again, I think sometimes we make assumptions about what's important to people at this time and it's not always the things that we think it is so it's important that the patient and the families lead on those conversations and we shouldn't make assumptions about what those emotional support needs are yeah yes thank you thank you very much uh, Nietzsche for uh, for this insight and then according to your experience uh, um, how can healthcare providers uh, ensure that families uh, receive the emotional support uh, they need during and after the loss uh, of a loved one. Yeah, absolutely. This is so important. Um, and I do think it's something that we don't do very well sometimes. I think we can be wrapped up in um, prioritising the person who has the cancer, which of course is important, but that can sometimes be at the detriment of the people behind them. And of course, I only spoke yesterday to a gentleman who was saying how he felt selfish, that he was worried about his anxiety, about how he was feeling about his wife. Um, and I think, you know, it's trying to break down um, those emotional concerns that people have and, and normalizing it you know um it isn't just about that person it's about their whole family as well um i think we need to be upskilling our workforce with mm -hmm. the right skills to support and recognize the needs of family members you know we we need to be doing enhanced communication skills we need to be empowering our health workforce to have difficult conversations um, it, it's not an easy thing to do, but it's important. Um, and we need to ensure that counselling and psychological support is available um, for everybody, particularly bereavement support, including children and having those conversations with children, because um, it's here in the UK, we rely really heavily on charity input to provide those kind of services. Um, there can be longer waiting times. Um, so, yeah, I think that's something that we we need to address by upskilling our our nurses and our doctors to be able to have those conversations with family members. Yes, yeah, so thank you for uh, uh, sharing these very uh, practical hints. Um, we come now to uh, uh, the, our uh, um, Anders Boving, our uh, uh, patients and survivor. Um, Anders, he is a, a Swedish pancreatic cancer survivor, a member of the cancer organization Palema in uh, Sweden. He is a retired from the printing industry and now dedicates his life uh, to his family, uh, his nine grandchildren, 
and the voluntary work for the awareness on pancreatic cancer. He considered a great honor to talk about the pancreatic journey, his pancreatic cancer journey, and how he managed uh, to survive. Uh, thank you, Anders, for accepting our invitations and to be uh, with us uh, this afternoon. So the, the first question to you is, uh, uh, what emotional support has been most helpful during your cancer journey? Share uh, your experience it's, with us. It's very easy to answer, but I would like first to say that <clears throat> I like the Lucia and uh, her relation between depression and survival. It was very important. Yes. Talia, I hope to meet you in Israel. I am there often. And Helena, I'm sorry that I didn't meet you in Koi because I need the emotional support there. <laughs> um, Andrea gave us a lot of things too. And Nikki, I am not there yet, so I, I don't know. <laughs> but, but my pancreas cancer started in Italy. And then I came to Karolinska and they told me that it's inoperable, it's too big and it uh, had spread to the ves vessels. So, so um, I never believed in doctors, so that's my philosophy. So I decided to, to go my own way. I decided to, with, to be open with my cancer to everyone I met, I didn't want to have any contact with people who, and relatives also and the family, who thought that the doctor, he was right. I will die within six to nine months. And I wanted to, to be with positive person only. And I have the caregivers doesn't exist seven years ago in Sweden. So my wife, she took care of me. And I have a very nice life today. And I can say that the first doctor who was uh, empathetic to me was Professor Marco del Chiaro. Because I think all doctors should give some a hint that they will do whatever they can to help the patient. I talk to patients every day or members and they get the message that, oh, you have only one month or 10 months to live and so on. And, and that's incredible that it still go on like this. So I, I he, Marco Del Chiaro gave me such a hope that he will try to operate me. No one could do it because it was too dangerous, too difficult. But he succeeded and I live a fantastic life now with insulin and creon. That's how I survive. And with my wife who helped me 24 hours a day. So that's fantastic. And I... I think that's very important. And I talk to many doctors that why don't you give a hope to every patient and not say, talk about the statistic. And, and uh, so far we haven't got any caregivers from the hospital or society. But now we start in Sweden to talk about that. We have organization for it. But in Palema, we have every second month, we have a caregivers discussion with, with, with those who are involved in pancreas cancer. So that's how we do it in Palema. And I think um, this is a very important seminar. I would like to have it in Sweden too. <laughs> well, we can have a try indeed. Yeah. <laughs> And Anders, uh, uh, do you like to share with us a moment in your journey where emotional support has been a very important and crucial? Yeah, that was the first, first time I met Professor Marco Del Chiaro. The, okay. All the other doctors said that it was no chance. I couldn't live so long time. But he said that he will try and do his best. And then 
that was fantastic. And then I met a uh, uh, doctor in, in uh, when I took the, the, uh, the um, chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. I did it in Stockholm and it was it, it was during the summer it was so bad organized so I asked to go to another hospital and I got it in a, a small town north of Sweden and they were very empathic and gave me a lot of hope when I was there so mm -hmm. that's that's something I remember very well this mm -hmm. person who gave me such a support yeah and the interesting is that I have still this support from Marco del Chiaro in Denver, where he is now, and all his colleagues in, in Sweden, I can contact immediately. Because in Sweden, it's very difficult as it is in Italy. I live in Italy now. Here you can have contact with the doctors on the internet, on Facebook, and on everything, and they give an answer. In Sweden, it's very, very difficult to get this help. Mm -hmm. So that's the situation. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Anders, for sharing uh, with us uh, your story. And um, uh, unfortunately, uh, the time is uh, really uh, running and we do not have time for a proper uh, question and answer sessions. But if you want uh, to write any uh, answers in the chat, we will be uh, do our uh, best to answer you uh, later. And uh, so we move uh, now to uh, the last uh, um, introductions of uh, the day uh, is uh, Christiana van der Hoven. Uh, she will uh, um, talk to, about uh, the PC project on uh, emotional support. And uh, Christiana, she is a psycho-oncologist uh, currently working in the palliative care in Lisbon. She has experience supporting individuals and families facing serious illness, including pancreatic cancer. Her work focuses on offering emotional and psychological support, helping people navigate the challenges of a diagnosis and treatment with compassion and practical tools for coping with the situations. She has been the project officer for the Pancreatic Cancer Europe Emotional Support and Pancreatic Cancer Project and uh, contributed to the preparations of the booklet that we launch uh, today. So, Christiana, thank you for uh, being with us. Uh, thank you, Luisa. The floor is yes. yours. Okay, thank you. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, PCE for this opportunity. Um, it's it's an honor uh, to me to uh, participate in this project. Uh, I would like also to thank uh, Dr. Luzia Travado uh, from Champalimau Foundation. I think she's no longer with us, but um, I'm I'm very grateful for her help and uh, her advice uh, throughout the project. Uh, I would like to thank you also, Lucia, Luisa, and Anna for your support and collaboration uh, all along the way. So now I'm presenting the project. Uh, uh, Pancreatic Cancer Europe has developed this project uh, to raise awareness and understanding about the urgent need to integrate emotional support into pancreatic cancer care and to address the unmet needs of patients and caregivers and to improve the emotional well-being and quality of life of patients. This project was based, based on studies and experiences of emotional su support shared by pancreatic cancer patients, survivors and caregivers. Uh, by using uh, some practical strategies to manage emotions, reduce emotional impact, and to promote self-care. And uh, patients compliant, uh, they cope better with the disease and treatments. This project has developed a series of resources. So we have two booklets, uh, for one for patients and other for healthcare professionals. And we have also a summary boards. They are available, available uh, at the 
uh, Pancreatic Cancer Europe website. So uh, here are some common emotions uh, when we are facing pancreatic cancer. Uh, these are negative emotions. It doesn't mean patients and caregivers have to feel of all of them. Uh, they fluctuate over time. They come and they can come and go. But they are also um, good emotions such uh, such as hope and gratitude. But um, if these negative emotions become persistent, extreme, or unstable, such as sadness, fear, panic, or worry. Uh, it, they, they may require professional support because of anxiety. Uh, here are some symptoms of depression and anxiety we must be aware of because if they persist, uh, patients or caregivers must uh, need um, must ask for help for professional help. <clears throat> we we have some coping strategies. Uh, in the booklets to help patients uh, to motivate them to talk about their feelings, set some goals and priorities, uh, some techniques, some mindfulness techniques and uh, uh, relaxation exercises. Uh, it is important to find comfort also, also in religion, uh, uh, to find some pleasure in some activity, daily activities and to seek professional help if necessary. Uh, we have also exercises from uh, some of transactional model of stress and coping and from uh, cognitive and behavioral uh, theory, but also from mindfulness and uh, relaxation techniques. So these exercises will help uh, patients and uh, caregivers also managing their stress, addressing negative thoughts, problem solving, mood monitoring, breathing and relaxation, mindfulness, gratitude, psychologic, psychological flexibility, and also an exercise of dignity for difficult, difficult times. Uh, we speak also about psychological intervention, interventions. Uh, these intervention, interventions sorry, can help patients at all stages of the disease and families to reduce their distress and psychological suffering and maintain these benefits over time. These interventions can be individually or in group and patients with their partner or caregiver in dyads. Dyads mean two people, couple, for example. Um, these intervention, interventions also uh, use techniques, uh, informational, educational, uh, relaxation, and uh, they act on emotions, thoughts, and behaviors. Uh, emotional support resources are also very uh, helpful uh, and useful because they give psychological support. And uh, it, is, it is also available uh, counseling. Peer support groups are very good. Also, psychoeducation, hypnosis, meditation, uh, mindfulness, as we said before, uh, physical exercise, sports, relaxation uh, techniques, yoga, religious or spiritual support, art and music therapy, and pet therapy. So I just want to say there are studies that prove that these interventions uh, are very good resources to help patients and caregivers. Uh, these approaches are aimed to uh, are, are aimed at reducing emotional suffering through reformulating catastrophic thoughts, increasing pleasurable pleasure, pleasurable activities, helping with pain, changing the focus of attention, and they are also available uh, uh, in online research resources such as chats, websites, teleconsultations, and others. Uh, it is very important to build a support system. Uh, family and friends uh, are a big source of strength, comfort, and encouragement. And uh, here we, we can find uh, someone to listen to, to, to us and relieve our stress and worry. Support groups are also very important 
The contact with other patients provides emotional support and reduces feelings of isolation. It promotes personal strength and resilience and also help with practical guidance and advice. Concerning patient organization, such as Pancreatic Cancer Europe, Digestive Cancer Europe and Cancer Patients Europe, they have a, a, an important role in supporting and empowering individuals affected by cancer. They provide information and various resources of support for patients and families. There is very important, uh, communication is also very important, not only with the family, but with uh, the healthcare team. And uh, when we, we also, um, uh, we encourage patients to prepare uh, their questions when they have before they go to, to doctor, doctor's appointments. Um, to bring someone with them to, to, to support and take notes. And we encourage patients to share their symptoms and emotions openly with the medical team and to, to not hesitate to ask help when needed. Um, I, I always have a, a special attention to uh, caregivers. Uh, because they have an important role uh, in the, their well-being impacts also patients. So my uh, advice to avoid caregiver burden is don't wait to be exhausted or overwhelmed. Um, take care of yourself, take breaks, do what you can, delegate when possible, ask for help and accept it when offered, uh, share your feelings, and seek for help from a psychologist or a counselor and from friends, family, or support groups and learn uh, about caregiver roles if possible. Thank you very much for your attention. And I would like to thank you all for your um, experiences you shared. Um, it was uh, really nice to meet you all and uh, participate in this project and uh, in this webinar also. Thank you. Yes, so thank you, Christiana, um, for presenting uh, the, uh, the project and the booklet. Uh, so the booklet is uh, now available on our website. Uh, you can download uh, for free uh, at this um, uh, link. Uh, and uh, it will be then translated also in several languages uh, in the next uh, months. Uh, at the moment, uh, the documents are available in English uh, only. So then uh, we come really at the very end of the, the webinar. Uh, I would like then to introduce Alfredo Carrato. He is a, um, our chairperson, pancreatic cancer chairperson, and he is a emeritus professor of medical oncology at uh, Alcala University in, uh, in Spain. He is a director of the research group on pancreatic cancer at the Spanish Network of Cancer Research and the researcher at the Ramon y Cayal Research Institute, both in Madrid, uh, in Spain. He has uh, served as a director of the Ramon y Cayal Institute for Health, as a president of the National Advisory Commissions of Medical Oncology at the Spanish Ministries of Health and Education, as president of the Spanish Society of Cancer Research and the Spanish Federation of Oncology Societies. He has been president of the Spanish Society of Medical Oncology, and he served as a director of the Medical Oncology Department and full professor of oncology at Elche University Hospital, Miguel Hernández University, and uh, Ramón y Cayal University Hospital at uh, Alcalá University. Thank you, Alfredo, for being with us um, today. So the task is uh, to... Uh, conclude uh, this uh, wonderful webinar. Thanks very much, Luisa. It's been a pleasure to attend to this uh, relevant uh, webinar. Uh, pancreatic cancer, you know, it's uh, increasing its incidence and uh, unfortunately uh, only 10% uh, of the patients diagnosed of pancreatic cancer survive. So uh, emotional well-being for patients and families especially is disturbed with uh, this sense of 
fear, of sadness, of anxiety, of depression, etc. And uh, uh, this emotional support is an unmet need in most of the uh, hospitals where pancreatic cancer patients are attended. So we uh, should aware of this situation to the uh, policy makers and the uh, 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 scientific community because it's an unmet need and uh, it uh, negatively affects the quality of life and also the clinical outcome of the patients uh, that are diagnosed of pancreas cancer. To cope with this uh, silent uh, and challenging disease and the uh, emotional exhausting diagnosis that everybody uh, lives after knowing the pancreatic cancer world uh, is affecting to them, we have listened to relevant experts that advise us of uh, 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 working uh, within a coordinated team that involves not only the physician, but also the nurse, the psychologist, the mm -hmm. social worker, etc. And it's important and crucial to start early from diagnosis. An early approach is necessary to cope with uh, this uh, uh, end of life uh, 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 um, situation, to have time for uh, grief, to uh, have time to uh, support the caregivers. Uh, and uh, also, uh, it's important that empathy and hope is given from this team, as our cancer patient survivors said. So uh, I would like to thank all speakers uh, all attendees, uh, Pancreatic Cancer Europe and European Pancreatic Cancer, our sponsors, of course, and the Pancreatic Cancer Europe team behind, Lu Luisa, Lucia, Anna, that have organized this successful meeting. <clears throat> and uh, I would uh, recommend you to download the booklet from the Pancreatic Cancer Europe web. Uh, Lucia, that is uh, uh, very uh, um, uh, modern in, in the uh, digital area, gave you this uh, uh, image that to download it. We are code. <laughs> yeah, the code, yes. But you, you can write Pancreatic Cancer Europe all together. It's www.pancreaticcancereurope.eu and you can download these two booklets that are very useful for all of us, patients, caregivers, health supporters, etc. Thanks very much to you all and enjoy the evening. Yes, thank you, Alfredo. So before closing definitely the webinar, um, my thanks also to all the speakers and the panelists. Um, I want to inform you that we will prepare a report from this webinar that will be available on our website. So please remain in contact with us and make good use of the documents, the resources that we will provide you with. So thank you again and enjoy your evening. Bye. Bye bye. bye thank you. Thank bye. you. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Good to you. Bye.